I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress, and your host for BC's Fossil Bounty. Join in the exploration of the fascinating science of paleontology, that lens that examines ancient animals, plants, and ecosystems, from wee single-cell organisms to big and mighty dinosaurs. My name is Julius Chetigny. I am a paleo artist and a scientific illustrator and a scientist, biological scientist. And welcome to this episode of BC's Fossil Bounty. I am somebody who uh, takes what scientists, other scientists study about the deep past of Earth and I attempt to visually reconstruct it in such a way that others uh, in the public are able to see the results of all of this study. My goal is to hope to sort of open kind of like a portal so that they're able to kind of step into this world, so to speak, uh, allow people to suspend their uh, disbelief as much as possible. So my style tends to be photorealistic or hyper-realistic as much as possible. I'm an artist, um, a self-taught artist, and I enjoy working uh, in an expressive way, but I'm also a scientist and so I endeavor to make my work look as accurate uh, and as realistic as possible, uh, hopefully as photorealistic as possible. But in the end, uh, what is most rewarding is when I am able to see the work that I do actually put on the walls of museums, for example, and to be able to see it at sometimes life size, sometimes even larger than life size and to uh, allow the public to be able to learn so much more about what many scientists have been uh, studying over years. Julius is a superbly talented paleo artist whose work combines his deep love of the world, scientific background, and skilled artistry to transport us into the deep past. His paintings, murals, and coins, stamps, and sketches invite you to look deeper, translating science to awe-inspiring beauty. His style spans the gamut from pen and ink to line drawings, watercolors, pastel, two-dimensional digital illustrations, and three-dimensional digital models. His superbly detailed work encompasses dinosaurs, prehistoric life, sharks, and our living animals. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and that is really very much at the heart of what I do. I try to take the many, many thousands of words of scientists, paleontologists, um, and ecologists, and to condense this down, to distill it, and to synthesize it into a visual reconstruction of the study, and to be able to show people, hopefully, what it was like in the world uh, many millions of years ago, billions of years ago. And it's very rewarding to go to a museum after an exhibit opens, for example, and to be able to see the work that I've been working on uh, in my studio and sort of come to life on the walls. Uh, it's, uh, it, it actually surprises me as well. One of the things that I love about my work is that even though I began as a scientist, starting in ecology uh, and then moving into microbiology for my PhD, I left science in a purely academic way and entered a full-time world of artwork, of scientific illustration. But I never had to truly leave science. 
Working with scientists, whether they are paleontologists or ecologists, geologists, um, and or even microbiologists, this is something that I want to do a lot more of in my work, um, I still get to interact with them very closely. And what's really exciting about that is that it allows me to tap into the same fascination with discovery of the unknown that uh, prompted me to enter science in the first place. It's uh, basically that I get to be a part of the scientific team, at the very end of course, but still the scientific team that not only publishes their work, but then also endeavors to disseminate it to the maximum sized audience possible. And of course, many scientists these days are finding that commissioning original paleo art uh, makes a big difference to how many people actually see the results of their work. Uh, not only because press release images help to show the public whenever a, a journal article publishes the work for the first time, and they don't have to read the paper to be able to know that it's there, but also because sometimes the work is selected for the cover of the journal. And so within the scientific community, you also have a larger number of uh, individuals, or other scientists of their colleagues who get to see it, who uh, read those journals. So I love being able to uh, keep one foot in the, you know, in the camp of science and one foot in the camp of art still. And in fact, my work requires me to do that. To balance the accurate depiction of a subject with the most interesting way visually to show it. And sometimes this interesting way, uh, you can push it to the point where it becomes maybe less realistic. And a good example is where people put many, many, many organisms into one shot, kind of like a, like a, like it's a concert happening in the, in the, you know, the Jurassic, for example, and everybody's been invited. But also lighting is a big one. And I love working with light as creatively as possible. Light is such a fascinating part of artwork. It makes a huge difference to know from which angle it's coming. So I love to play around with selecting different angles of lighting, uh, different times of the day. One of my favorites tends to be sort of the golden hour, as it's called, the last hour of sunlight as the sun is very, very near the horizon. And you get these wonderful uh, sharp contrasts between light and shadow. And then underwater, it's a whole other uh, kind of a game there. There you have to think about how light transmits uh, from the atmosphere into water bodies and how it changes its direction and the spectrum as it enters the water and is refracted through the surface and then is uh, scattered and absorbed by different uh, components in the water on its way down. So it's physics and optics become important uh, components of this work, as well as being familiar with the paleontology, with the science um, uh, of, the pale of paleontology that goes into reconstructing some of these ancient landscapes. I love to teach. I love educational outreach. I love to endeavor to inspire people to be interested in science uh, and to be interested in caring for this absolutely amazing natural world that we have around us. I'm a biologist uh, at heart. Uh, I've, you know, even though I've left academia, I have always retained this absolute love of biology. Our biosphere is 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 the most amazing thing around us. It's the it's the most magical thing in the universe, in my opinion. And I feel honored to be able to be to have a job that allows me to recreate this biosphere visually and in creative ways. Um, and to be able to use my work to convey messages of this sort of, 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 for people to be inspired and interested in it to hopefully millions of people or thousands of them, however many end up seeing it. The, the biggest ones, the, the most uh, sort of, I guess, the, the largest scale have often been the museum exhibits. And I've uh, had the pleasure to work with a large number of museums from around the world. I think it's close to 40 by now. and. It's neat because I get to work with anything from you know, small panels up to giant murals. I think the latest one that just opened at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis is like 190 feet long. So that was my biggest one yet. And I've done many, for many museums here in Canada, from the ROM, the Terrell Museum, uh, the uh, uh, Fossil Discovery Center. Uh, and then I've had the pleasure to work with a great number of scientists to produce press release images for them. Uh, or figures for papers. 
Uh, and then again, there's also besides books, there are some interesting types of projects. Uh, I was, I was, it was really fun when I was contacted for the first time by the Royal Canadian Mint. And uh, they asked if I wanted to compete for a uh, dinosaur coin series. And, and of course, this was a big honor. I mean, you get to design Canadian money, which is such an unusual kind of a thing for an artist. Uh, and so I, I did, and I won the competition. Since then, I've uh, designed close to about 40 other coins uh, for the Royal Canadian Mint. And then I've had a chance to work with uh, another designer for the for Canada Post as well, and also for the United States Postal Service. And so, and for those ones, I've had a chance to do illustrations of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals of uh, Canada, uh, a very large uh, T-Rex and well-known T-Rex for the States, and also a set of uh, the sharks of Canada. One of the things that really uh, excites me about some of this work, especially now that I mentioned the, the, the shark stamps, the publishers or the, um, in this case, Canada Post, made a, an effort to also highlight the conservation status of these sharks. Uh, as a biologist initially, or and, and as somebody who absolutely loves the biosphere, the major force driving me uh, in my life is to find ways to protect the living world around us. That's what drives me the most. That's what fuels my soul, so to speak. Um, artwork is one way that I can use to deliver messages to others, to hopefully help them to wish to care for the biosphere as well. And so when I get a project, um, like with Canada Post, to produce a series of stamps uh, that highlights particular species of sharks in our waters, uh, which are in many cases endangered or vulnerable or you know, very much uh, threatened by our activities as humans, I jump in that opportunity. Uh, any chance I have to be able to use my work to send a message to others uh, uh, about how amazing the world ar lives around us and how important it is and how much we can do to make a difference for it to survive and so that we don't lose species. So that has always been an, a fun thing for me. Canada's Royal Canadian Mint designs and manufactures some of the world's most beautiful coins using sophisticated coin production technology. But where do those designs come from? How do they find their way into our money and into our pockets? The answer is that they're clever enough to seek out talented Canadians to help them in their work. They choose designs that appeal to the greatest number of Canadians possible, something that reflects who we are as a people, our diversity, and our shared and differing worldviews. So I'd like to share with you some of the uh, pieces that I've actually produced that have been published or released to the public, basically. I've illustrated several books. This one is interesting because it uh, highlights several of the murals in smaller form, of course, that I did for the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And so it's a companion book to the exhibit, uh, but it's a nice way to, to see a large proportion of the pieces that I did. And these, this is, of course, um, something that is includes work from myself and several other artists, but most of the pieces um, of the reconstructions of, of ancient life are my own. So. Uh, it's kind of like a little bit of a, uh, a, a teaser of the of parts of the exhibit that way. So this piece here is actually kind of fun because it shows a Carboniferous forest uh, from hundreds of millions of years ago. And in the exhibit, it's uh, basically life-size. So you walk into this a, a coal mine at first, and then you exit the coal mine area into this wonderful uh, bright area that uh, shows this uh, mural uh, at um, a size that would be comparable to if you were standing there. And the whole idea between some of these uh, images, these murals at the, uh, the museum there, were to sort of create a sort of a portal for people to imagine that they step into this prehistoric times. And so it's kind of nice to be able to step into it and see all the many different life forms that occurred that were very alien compared to today. So there's a lot of different things that the book covers in Permian animals, for example. And the nice thing about it too and is that it goes right through some of the major uh, biological catastrophes that took place, like the Permian-Triassic extinction event, where a massive amount of volcanism uh, 
we raced about 95% of life on Earth or so, right through to the Jurassic. So work that I did on the murals ranged from about the Precambrian right up to modern times, or almost modern times, to the Holocene, uh, through the Cretaceous as well, and how birds and uh, dinosaurs are closely related, how birds have descended from dinosaurs, uh, and right up to through the rise of mammals and the the enormous, uh, the complex uh, mammal-based ecosystems or more mammal-dominated ecosystems in the past, uh, right up to uh, nearly today when we have uh, the early sort of the Holocene time period, which is only a few thousand years ago, and right up to when uh, humans have already been present on Earth here and basically a way kind of to show how um, we now have, leave our footprint on the earth and of course this is very a uh, nice exhibit because it also emphasizes how we have to watch how we tread carefully to avoid putting too much of a footprint on the earth. So one of the things that uh, I've had the pleasure to do is to design coins for the Royal Canadian Mint and uh, this one here is one of the earlier ones that I did um, and as you can see, it's in color, so there's a layer of printed ink on the silver coin. But uh, it was interesting because uh, it was a series of prehistoric animals uh, found in Canada. This one is Tiktaalik, which is an early tetrapod, a fish that had uh, limbs that could be used partially for, for walking, uh, probably especially in the water, but it had very leg-like fins. And so what this coin and this series of coins I uh, had that was unique about them is that there's also a layer of ink that is glow in the dark on top of the color. So the color layer reconstructs the living form of the animal and then I'm gonna shine a black light or UV lamp onto it to charge it and that shows off the other layer of ink which is actually in the form of the animal's skeleton. And so when this is charged and it's brought into a dark room, you don't see the colored version, but you do see the skeleton of the animal. And so this actually got a lot of uh, popularity uh, on various talk shows and stuff as well. And um, there were a total of, I think, five in this series. And after that, uh, there were several other coins in which they had employed uh, glow-in-the-dark features, but this was a fun one uh, with which to begin. Through his outreach work, Julius has connected with thousands of teachers, parents, adults, and kids, citizen scientists all, to share in his love of paleontology in the natural world. His work is a catalyst for environmental change and the protection of our animals that still walk this earth today. Children's books are something that I love to do uh, because it reaches an audience that are going to be tomorrow's scientists, uh, politicians, policymakers, responsible citizens, you know, the leaders of tomorrow. And if we're able to spread some of this, this fascination with the biosphere to them, to, to encourage them to take an interest in it and in science and in paleontology, that is just hugely rewarding to me. It's so wonderful to have museums that display this to the public. This is why I'm so excited to work with museums to reconstruct some of these animals uh, to show people what's our best guess is what they looked like when they were alive. And of course, to do that, we rely on not only the beautifully preserved remains that we can see when preparators remove the surrounding rock matrix, but then you can go a lot, a step farther than that. And I've worked on fossils uh, remains that some scientists have had the innovative ideas to examine in such ways that they can gain information about the color or the tone of these animals that they had when they were alive. So we now know that there are certain pigments that have certain breakdown products or that were preserved in their original state in some rare cases, or subcellular structures that indicate uh, something about the tone that the feathers or the skin may have had in life. And this takes some of the guesswork out of it. It's really fun to be able to do this and to give talks as well about my work, where I get to explain to people the fun that it is of, and the challenge of reconstructing these animals and plants that we can't go out to see anymore. And that's part of what drives my work as well. I, we can't go and photograph these. We can't walk out you know, a million years ago or half a billion years ago and photograph these animals and plants anymore. Uh, we need to work as paleo artists closely with paleontologists who do the work of teasing out this information about them from the rocks. 
and then translating that into a reconstruction of hopefully what the animal and plant or, or fungus looked like when it was alive. One of the other ways that um, this past couple of years I've been able to apply my artwork uh, centered around or was very much stimulated by the current pandemic. In early 2020, there was a lot of lockdowns happening. Students did not go to school, for example, in public schools. And instead, they, in many cases, they stayed at home and studied that way. So suddenly they had a lot more time on their hands. I found that there was a lot of conservation organizations that were willing to partner up with me to find a way to hopefully keep them occupied and interested in the biosphere. And so what we did is uh, create these sort of hour-long how to draw webinars with a variety of organizations such as uh, Sierra Club BC, Sharks for Kids, the Porpoise Conservation Society and several others. They would host the one-hour webinar, which was free for anybody to attend, and I would basically go through step-by-step step how to draw a particular species that we had selected that uh, usually is one that was threatened by um, some activities uh, by our species or, you know, that experienced very, very low populations uh, that could benefit from our work in conservation. In the meantime, while I was showing participants how to draw these animals, uh, or plants in some cases, I would also then talk about the biology. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me not to just uh, engage students in, uh, in artwork, but to then go back to my sort of biological roots and, and, and just totally geek out and talk about the biology of these fascinating organisms. And it was really nice because we had a chance to show people and tell people about how these complex ecosystems work uh, and how there's so much more to the world than we often uh, see just on the surface. And to be able to interact with people who are experts in this field and who have been doing this for over 20 years. So it's, it's an honor for me to be able to interact with people that way and to use this and artwork to be able to spread these messages. And we've reached over 10,000 or 20,000 students in the first couple of years. So that was really rewarding. Um, that's one of the things that gives me hope. People often ask me uh, what advice I would give them for people who are interested in getting into this field, uh, in paleo art, for example. And um, well, there's a number of different things you'd have to, to consider. Uh, the main thing is it has to be a passion. Unless you have a position at a particular museum or publishing house or whichever, you never have a solid idea of what the future holds. There's going to be a lot of bidding for projects, so it's a good idea to become good at um, showing yourself off and what you do in an effective way. Become very familiar with the scientific literature around the subjects that you're interested in illustrating. Because for me, uh, I've had scientists tell me that they enjoy working with me because I'm so familiar with some of the basic stuff that they don't have to explain a lot of it. Pay attention to accuracy as much as possible. That is going to be one of the, the, the biggest aspects um, uh, in paleo art and scientific illustration to be able to master. That's why I'm saying that it's something that you have to be very passionate about to be able to, to make effectively happen. If you work really, really hard, uh, then you can make something of yourself this way. Science has always been something that excites me a lot. And paleo art allows me to hopefully interest others in science. And so to me, that's very rewarding as well. Hugely talented and humble, the impact he has had on our world is tremendous. He's a scientist, artist, and passionate conservationist wrapped up in a delightful and prolific human being. I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress, and thank you for joining us on this week's episode of BC's Fossil Bounty.